Do you need to relax in order to discharge trauma or do you need to discharge trauma in order to relax? The answer is kind of both and I will explain why. My name is Justin Sinceri. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist helping you to understand the polyvagal theory clearly and apply it to your traumatized state so you can finally get the relief you deserve and need. Welcome to Stuck Not Broken. This podcast is of course not therapy nor is it intended to be a replacement for therapy. I got this message or this comment on a blog post. I'll put a, a link to it in the description so you can read it for yourself. But it's called, the, the blog is called Polyvagal Safety and How to Use It. The comment doesn't have a title, just the blog. Polyvagal Safety and How to Use It. And I'm going to call this person Mark. Uh, it's a little bit longer. I'm going to break this up into chunks. Um, but yeah, here, here's the first part of here. here uh, Mark says, hi there. Hey, Mark. Mark says, hi there. I've been through uh, the trauma therapy mill and I'm not sure what to do now. I've seen three SE therapists, that's somatic experiencing. I've seen three somatic experiencing therapists who unfortunately haven't been able to help me. So I want to just uh, pause here for a moment. Somatic experiencing, uh, people who are credentialed, I guess, in somatic experiencing are not necessarily therapists. If they are not therapist so that a therapist is someone who like a psychotherapist that's someone who is licensed in their state at least within the united states that's the way it works i'm not sure about every other you know country or state um or every other governing body but in the united states each state has their own licensing standards schooling standards uh so what so that's different than somatic experiencing Somatic experiencing does not require that you be a therapist. Somatic experiencing as a, uh, a modality has its own standards, yeah, uh, but that is distinct from being a licensed therapist. So a therapist can be trained in somatic experiencing. That's actually something I'm pretty interested in. Uh, a therapist can be trained in somatic experiencing and become an SE practitioner, but an SE practitioner can be that on their own. They don't need the um, the psychotherapy license if you know based on what what state that they're in. Hopefully that makes sense. So saying three SE therapists might not necessarily indicate that it's a psychotherapist, someone who's licensed in their state. You might I don't know if you I don't maybe maybe they are actually therapists, but it could be also somatic experiencing practitioners. So Mark goes on to say, my body is stuck in a pattern of activation, which causes me an extraordinary amount of discomfort. My psoas are constantly contracting in the area, often my whole body, buzzes and rushes with real ferocity at times. It's pretty much just raw sensation with no emotional component except for frustration. My mind is very obsessive too, and I'm getting more bewildered as the days go on because I'm still not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, of course, Mark, I can't tell you what to do. Um, this is, again, not therapy, of course. And if it's just like a physical issue, I don't know. I, I don't really, I'm not, uh, that's out of my scope of practice and expertise. And of course, this isn't therapy, but just as I'm addressing this in general, I have no idea. I, I can't really go into if it's a physical issue by itself, you probably best to see a doctor. So I, I don't know. I work as a therapist. I work uh, from the behavioral down to the emotional and cognitive. So for the behavioral domain, down to the emotional and cognitive domain. So think about it as like layers or a funnel. Behavioral to me is at the top, if, for, as far as what I'm using. Below that is, as we whittle down, is emotional and cognitive. And then below that is sensation and impulse. And now usually therapists will stick with the emotional and the cognitive and the behavioral. Every now and then they'll incorporate spiritual. I'm an atheist, so it doesn't really, uh, I don't do a whole lot with that. But for some therapists who are more into the somatic uh, pieces of what makes us us, they will uh, seek out further training or do their own research um, and learn more about sensations and impulses. So somatic experiencing practitioners, from what I know of, of somatic experiencing, should be able to do that pretty well. Um, that's something I've researched on my own. And um, yeah, so the sensation and impulse is really where I hope to get with people, especially when it comes to uh, stuck trauma. 
to a stuck defensive state. I really want to get to that sensation and, and impulse. Um, to those, those domains at some point don't have to, but uh, when it comes to really getting unstuck from trauma, that is, I think, pretty darn important. Also, uh, mental health therapists are not, we're not trained in like physical therapy stuff, like physical issues. So maybe uh, in general that these could be or should be uh, handled by a physical therapist. I don't know. That's, that's like coming to a therapist and saying, hey, I'm, I'm having this physical issue probably would not get you super far except for like a referral to somebody else that might be more appropriate. And it's probably going to be a doctor. Maybe, I don't know about somatic experiencing practitioners. I don't think that they, I don't, maybe, I don't, I don't know. Uh, a Reiki practitioner, R-E-I-K-I. I don't know much about that, but they work with the body um, as well. So that might be more appropriate if you're into that holistic kind of stuff. I don't, I don't really know too much more about it. And I don't know if they can start from the physical or not, but I know for therapists, if you come in and saying, hey, I'm having this physical issue, it's probably not going to get you super far for the vast majority of therapists. Though, so for me, even though I may not be able to start from the physical, you know, with uh, some sort of muscle issue, I could definitely work with frustration. Therapists should be able to work from the emotional aspect of things, the, the emotional domain, and then work from there. So if someone were to say, and actually Mark kind of says something like this, but if someone were to say, I feel lethargy, so I feel um, no energy in my body. And I don't, that, so to me, that's more of a physical, like I, I have no energy, I have no physical drive in my body, but there could be an, an emotional po component as well. So the person might say, I feel lethargy, no energy in my body, but there's there's no emotional component to it. But at the same time, I feel worthless and uh, anhedonic, so the inability to feel pleasure. So that person, let me start this over. This person might say, I feel lethargy, no energy in my body, but there is no emotional component. But at the same time, I feel worthless and uh, I don't experience pleasure uh, because uh, about having no motivation and being lethar lethargic. So they might say that I feel no motivation and lethargic and I feel worthless and I don't feel pleasure about having no motivation and being lethargic. But for me, as the way I work as a therapist, is, well, what, what came first? And I spend... Um, I often spend a pretty good amount of time, uh, you know, in, in my, it's definitely my initial assessment or when like panic attacks coming up, come up or um, relapses and whatever, like we, I want to spend time doing a, a chain analysis of, okay, what, what happened first and then what happened before that and as best as you, as best you could remember. So I, we can get a clearer picture of what's going on in that moment. So if, if someone says I have no lethargy or I'm sorry, if I have no uh, energy and I also feel worthless and they're attributing the worthlessness to feeling uh, lethargy. That could be true, sure. But I could also see someone who feels worthless feeling lethargy at the same time, and they probably stem from a, a defensive state that's more of a shutdown. So the point here is that I think it's easy for us to attribute this came first and then that, but we may not know. Like Even though we know ourselves best, yeah, we're not exactly objective. When it comes down to it, we, we might not be and probably are not all that objective about our own experiences and what we're going through and whatnot. Um, a lot of times in, in therapy, someone will say, I think this way, therefore I feel that way. And we know from story follow state concept of polyvagal theory that it's probably, yeah, these things can feed into each other, but there's a, a defensive state or there's a polyvagal state that is influencing the cognitions. So it's, I think it's more accurate to say that there's some sort of defensive state that is affecting the thoughts in our brain. And yeah, the thoughts in our brain can influence our, our emotions as well, or our state as well. But it's not like people are able typically to say, you know, my, my thoughts are really being flavored by the emotion I'm going through, which is being flavored by the, uh, the polyvagal state that I'm in and my stuck or my in, uh, incomplete impulses and the sensations I'm living with, like usually we're not able to parse things out like that. And so saying this thing comes first and then I'm doing this might not be accurate. It could be. So yeah, for me, it's like, what, what, what came first? And that's where I, I like to do a, a chain analysis um, to see what kind of how things flow. It brings me a lot of information as a therapist. Now, on top of this, uh, Mark mentioned frustration. That is an emotion. Frustration is an emotion and I think it's a direct experience or a emotional experience of a defensive state. So for me, frustration, when I feel frustrated and when I notice it with other people is that there's some flight fight energy there. There's energy to do something. 
we, we, we have mobility in our system, but, or so that mobility is being directed toward a task and maybe that's finishing a, a level in a video game. Maybe that's completing something at work. Uh, maybe it's trying to communicate. It could be all kinds of stuff. So we have mobility in our system and we're directing it to something. But then we're stopped from completing it, from completing the goal, or, or we cannot complete the goal. So something is stopping us or we simply are not able to complete the goal for some reason. So that, that's frustrations when you, you're mobile and you're ready to do something. You're trying to do something, you put in a plan maybe, but then you're stopped or you can't do it for some reason. And then you get frustrated because you can't meet the goal. You can't use your mobility toward that goal. So I would just say, be careful when attributing thoughts and emotions. Um, I particularly particularly pay attention to the sequences of the SSIEC domains. This is something you may have heard me talk about before, uh, but I like to look at what's the sequence of events, what, what's actually happening when I'm going through something or when my client is going through something, what is happening now, what came before and what came before that. I think it's extremely important. And actually right now I'm feeling some frustration because I am mobile and I am wanting to record this in silence and I was trying to sneak in some time, but now there is a commotion. There's noise across the street, people blowing leaves around and whatnot. So I'm going to ignore that for now and hopefully it's not too much when I'm in editing. I'm going to continue to use my mobilization energy to complete this task of recording this episode, which I really want you to hear. Back to my point, uh, be careful when you're attributing thoughts and emotions. Um, I like to pay attention to the sequences of events. If you struggle with that, I have a free download. A free download, it's called SSIEC. It's State, Sensation, Impulse, Emotion, Cognition. And that's at justinlmft.com slash SSIEC. justinlmft.com slash SSIEC. A lot of letters, I know. I'll put a link in the description as well. But basically, if you struggle with parsing out, well, what's a sensation, what's an emotion, what's a cognition, what's an, what's an emotion, because these things, what's an impulse, like a, a, all those. If you have difficulty identifying those, this is um, a sheet that uh, kind of like lays out, here's different words for these different categories of, of, of your experiences. And so you can start to look at that and build language for what you're going through, and that might help you to differentiate, you know, these different pieces of your moment to moment experience. And also one more request, actually do me a quick favor if you can and hit the uh, subscribe button or tap it or click it. You can do it whatever way you want. Uh, following is a, make sure it ensures that you get the next episode that comes out or subscribing, but it also tells whatever platform you're on that this is important and that somebody else should listen to it. So do me a favor. That'd be uh, much appreciated if you could uh, subscribe or follow to this. Let's get on with uh, Mark's next segment here. This is topic number two. Mark says, I've had therapists try to get me to further activate my system whilst also asking me to relax. And at this point, I'm confused as hell and exhausted because the activation and discomfort have really wrecked my sleep. I'm very depleted of resources and I can't stop the activation, which I really need to happen so I can rest properly. Now, this, this is not the way I work as a therapist who has some level of somatic um, interventions built into what they do. I'm not full on somatic therapist. I can blend in CBT stuff. Um, I can blend in solutions focus. I do that often, but then I also blend in a lot of uh, somatic type of elements. So I don't work this way. This might be, I don't know. I'm not, I don't want to assume this is some other modality, but I don't work this way. I start with where my client is at in the moment and not where they want to be or where I want them to be. Of course, we have a goal for therapy. We, we have a behavior that we want to address or a reduction in emotion or an increase in some other emotion or reduction in thought. We, we do all that stuff. So there's a goal for therapy that we have created and agreed upon, of course. But I just want to acknowledge that now it's raining on top of the noise across the street. Now it's raining but I still have mo mobility in my system and I want to record this for you. So I'm going to keep going forward. And as long as this, you can hear me okay in the editing, I'm going to publish it the way it is, all right? <laughs> I'm going to allow myself to feel my frustration and keep moving forward. So of course we have a goal for therapy. But when someone comes into a session with dysregulation, 
or even without dysregulation, no matter where they are at when they come in, that's where we start. I'm not going to focus on like a single body part or pain or something like that and then work on that. That's not what I do. Um, I'm typically going to start more with emotional or cognitive content, typically, and then work inward. At least in my mind, it's this kind of like funnel. We, the, we're going to start with behaviors, uh, emotions, and cognitions. That's kind of the top of the funnel. I just say behaviors at the top, emotion and cognition below that, and then sensation and impulse below that. And then the polyvagal uh, state would be below that. So I'm going to, that's the way I work is I work broad and then I narrow it down as the session goes on. Uh, so I'm typically going to start with emotional cognitive while also focusing on grounding and safety uh, throughout the session. And that might come up as me pointing out, hey, how are you feeling right now? Do we need to do some grounding? And depending on kind of their awareness of all that. Or it might be they're coming in dysregulated and we're doing grounding right off the bat and then working on whatever we're going to work on. So the, the focus is always going to be, at least in the back of my mind, the, the priority is safety. If they're not in their safety state, not a whole lot of good, or if they don't have access to it, not a whole lot of good can be done as far as progressing on the treatment plan goal. So that's my priority. So I'm not really trying to activate them, or I'm, I'm, I'm also not trying to get them to relax. So I don't have this goal in mind of like speeding them up or slowing them down. I'm just meeting them where they're at. Okay. So I'm not trying to activate them. I'm not trying to get them to slow down. I'm not trying to get them to relax. They're probably already more active or relaxed already. So they already have some flavor in their system of mobility or immobility or safety. So they're already coming in with something. And then my goal is, can we, can I attune to that first off as a provider can I meet them where they're at while staying anchored in my safety state? So can I co-regulate with them? Can I, um, you can call that mirroring, I suppose, on some level. Uh, but basically, can I attune? Can I meet them where they're at um, while staying regulated? And then if I can do that, self-regulation and co-regulation, they kind of take over from there. Uh, in, in large part, not 100%, but in large part, there's a lot of good that can be done from me attuning to my client, co-regulating with them, and then also their own self-regulation in the midst of that. Now, as this process unfolds, we mindfully, we mindfully experience and we witness the process unfold while always staying anchored in our safety state, while also monitoring our systems for too much dysregulation. And I say R, for, for me, it's more just for myself. I don't really announce to them what I, you know, what, I, what I'm feeling in that moment. Uh, I, I just monitor my own state. For the client, I am prompting them to look inward and notice how much safety they have in their system. If if they have, if we're using this polyvagal language, if not, I may ask them. Uh, I'll, I'll use more general language that means the same thing. But uh, yeah, so while we're while I'm attuning to them, while self regulation, co regulation are happening we mindfully experience whatever's happening inside of them. We witness it and we watch the process unfold while maintaining and prioritizing anchoring in the safety state and monitoring for dysregulation that might be surfacing. Like I had a session recently where I had asked a question that was too broad and my client was wise enough to recognize or insightful or enough, I'm not sure how to put it, but they recognize I just had this big spike of anxiety and, and uh, they you know, made a motion with their hand, like above their head, like a big spike of anxiety. And so it was like, oh, cool. oh, thank you so much for recognizing that. Let's whittle this down. Let's get more specific. So if I'm not doing what the basics that I just laid out, and, and yeah, there's more to it. Yes, I'm going to use more um, therapeutic implement uh, interventions and techniques along with, but that's just the, the basic process that I laid out or basic idea of when someone comes in the room. I'm not trying to get them to do something exactly. If I'm trying to activate someone who's in dorsal, it's probably going to fail. If, if they're in, if they're in a, a dominant dorsal state, it's probably going to be fail. It's going, probably going to fail. I need to be with them. I need to meet them in dorsal while staying anchored in my safety state first. If I try to relax somebody who's in flight fight, it's probably going to fail. I need to be with them first. I ask sometimes I'll ask my clients just to kind of assess in the moment. I'll ask them, you know, how are you able to breathe into your belly? Can you take a deep breath in? Can you extend it slowly? 
Someone who's in flight fight cannot do that. Very or it's painful. <laughs> it's and we can kind of laugh at it, and that helps to regulate actually. But uh, it, it's it's going to fail if I insist on them slowing down. It may not be super helpful. But if I can meet them where they're at, and provide basic therapy skills, normalization, validation, unconditional positive regard. If I can do these basic things, that can help to slow down naturally, and then we can start doing uh, other therapeutic work. So if someone is in like a panic or a rage, if they come in like a freeze, a dysregulated freeze state, um, I probably can't slow them down. Um, I don't have the power to do that. And what I do actually is match their energy while staying anchored in my safety state. So when I say I'm, I'm matching their energy, I don't mean that I'm dysregulated with them. I don't mean that I'm you know, running out of the room. What I mean is that I can stay anchored in my safety state and I can meet, I can get up with them. I can move around with them. We can take a walk outside. I can talk a little bit higher with them, not dominant, but I'm just kind of meeting them where they're at. That's a lot different than someone coming in dysregulated, panicky, and I'm like whispering like, hey, calm down. It's okay. You're okay. Like that would drive me personally uh, up the wall. So I, I don't think that if I'm trying to do something to get them somewhere that are not, I don't think that's help helpful. But if my priority is to first match them, meet them, stay anchored in my safety state and provide co-regulation, as they start to receive the co-regulation and start to even self-regulate, then we can be more proactive about, hey, let's do this. Hey, are you ready to take that deep breath into your belly now? Let's, let's, tr let's try that out and see where you're at. Or, hey, what, what, uh, what, which of my fidgets in the room right now? Which, what's pulling you toward it? What, can, what, what feels right? And then we can work from there. So if the, if the provider that you're with, no matter who they are, if they're a therapist or SE practitioner or whatever, if they're trying to get you to be somewhere that you're not, then co-regulation might be lacking. They maybe, I don't know, but they might be coming from their own dysregulated state and they're trying to fix the problem. They're trying to fix you or they're trying to fix your emotions rather than saying, hey, you have your emotions. Let me be there with you while I stay anchored. I'll meet you there. And that's kind of, I think acting is more of a, like an emotional container, I guess. There might be some misattunement. If they're trying to get you to somewhere that you're not, there might be some misattunement there, and that's not co-regulation. So I don't try to actively work someone up their ladder through techniques, not exactly, at least not while they're dysregulated. I try to meet them where they're at. As they become more regulated, then we can be more proactive about further ladder climbing. That's just the way I work, typically. And times where I've attempted to implement something that I think is helpful to someone who's not able to receive it has not been helpful. So I join them with where they are on their ladder while stay, staying anchored in my safety state and providing co-regulation. So do we speed up or relax the client? Um, I don't know. I would say let's just start with where you're at. That's the starting point. And, and that might be, can I understand what you're going through? Can I maybe even feel what you're going through in my own way? It's not going to be the same. Can I understand cognitively? Can I uh, ex have empathy? Can I feel what you're going through right now? Your true experience right now without judging it, without trying to change it. Can I just be there with you? That's kind of like, that's where I start. Um, I, I would not start by speeding up or relaxing a client. Really I, ask yourself this. It's um, especially for the providers here or for you if you're, in your, if you're in your own therapy or working with an SE practitioner. What will, what, what helps someone to enter their safety state? What do we need to enter our safety state? We need a safe environment. We need safe people. So people, like, we can't be being attacked. We can't be being judged. Uh, I don't think it helps. The, the environment that we're in should be uh, safe enough. So safe people, safe environment. Uh, ideally, we have co-regulation. We have understanding. We're being listened to. We're not being judged. And this is all the basic therapy stuff. This is all the stuff that us therapists should be absolutely nailing. And then on top of all that, what helps someone enter their safety state is mindfulness uh, of the present moment. But to have mindfulness, you have to have some level of safety in your system already. Uh, but then you build on that and you build on them uh, on what's happening within you in the present moment. Th this is what helps someone enter the safety state. The goal of therapy is not to speed someone up or slow them down. The goal is, well, besides the treatment plan goal, session to session, the goal is, can we access our safety state? Great. From there, can we now access some stuck defensive state? energy. Can we titrate and pendulate through that? So I don't, for me, I wouldn't call that speeding up or slowing down. To me, that's the priority is safety. From safety, can we also feel into your defensive state if we're working on this like stuck trauma kind of stuff? 
Sometimes people want to, sometimes people come in and they just want to work on, hey, this is the, my, my biggest issue and I, I need help dealing with it this week or I need to help, you know, work on boundaries and stuff. But so this is really, the, what I laid out is really more specific to trauma, to, to your stuck state. So Mark finishes it up and he says, I feel like I've been told that you need to discharge this energy in order to relax, but you won't be able to discharge this energy until you learn to relax. Yeah, that, Mark, that makes a lot of sense because it seems kind of conflicting. If that's what you're being told, if that's what you're being told, yeah, that's confusing. If you're leaving a session with confusion, that's a problem, I, I think, as well. I, I, uh, I think it's really important to have clarity on what you're doing in session, but also what to do after the session in order to build on it. So as a client therapy, I, I want to empower you to ask, hey, wh what does that mean? How does that make sense? And if the therapist can't answer it, that's a red flag in my opinion. Uh, I, I pride myself on being able to answer everything that my client is asking. If, if I'm implementing something and I can't explain why, that's a problem for me. And that's a red flag uh, for the client to pick up on. But that doesn't really come up. I don't make stuff up and I don't... Um, try out something that I don't, uh, that I don't have, uh, understanding of. So yeah, that's anyhow, red flag. Okay. So that's a behavioral level of understanding. If, if someone's telling you, we need to speed you up and slow you down to me, that's really kind of a behavioral and that's a very shallow top level understanding. We need to make you do this. We need to make you do that. Eh, I, I don't, I don't, If, if that's all you're getting, uh, Mark, then yeah, that doesn't seem to really be cutting the mustard for me. Um, it's a very behavioral level. And that, to me, that's just like saying, that's like telling someone who's like in a panic attack, maybe, hey, you just need to, you need to calm down. Like, yeah, no sh Um, I'm not there yet. You know what I mean? That's like telling someone who's pissed off, like if the students in my school, they get angry and they leave the classroom and they'll go, you know, run through the parking lot. And yeah, we can tell them, hey, stop it. Of course, and we can tell them, dude, take a deep breath, calm down. Yeah, but they're just not quite there to accept it. It doesn't mean we don't say it, I guess, but it's a very behavioral level of like, hey, just stop doing that. So that, that's, that's the way I read that dichotomy of you need to discharge this energy in order to relax, but you won't be able to discharge this energy until you learn to relax. That I think is a very shallow kind of understanding of, of all this. And if they can't explain further in session, that's a red flag. So in order to address the, this problem, you don't need to relax exactly. I, I'm actually going to muddy the water a little bit. Hopefully this will make more sense. You don't need to relax exactly. You need to activate the body safety state in order to have the vagal break active to then allow defensive states to shift. So do you need to relax in order to discharge your trauma? Um... Behaviorally, that's kind of what it looks like. You need to be able to be in your safety state. When your safety state's active, your vagal break is on. When your vagal break is on, your, cal your heart beats at a calmer pace. If your heart beats at a calmer pace, you're going to look more relaxed. You're, you're going to be able to exist in stillness, the mixed state, the mixed polyvagal state. So telling someone you need to relax is the very behavioral top level way of saying what I just said. And I'm hoping that's what they mean uh, if they have polyvagal uh, knowledge. But that, that's really it, is we have to get the safety state active. Once the safety, safety state is active, then you'll be able to exist in uh, stillness and you'll be able to be more mindful of what's happening inside of you. And then if you can do that and tap into your stuck defensive state, then, yeah, you'll probably notice more energy coming into your system. You'll probably notice, depending on the flavor of what's happening inside of you, you'll probably notice that stuck defensive state energy surfacing and you'll become more mobilized. If you're coming out of shutdown, up into fight, you're gonna feel more aggression. You're gonna feel that power come in your system and we want the vagal break to be active to be able to tolerate it. If you're coming out of a free state, you're gonna notice some fear and you're gonna kinda have to be able to sit with the immobility of fear and the stuck flight fight energy of fear. But we don't want to go there, at least the way I work, I don't want to go there with my client until I know their vagal break is able to handle that because I don't want to re-traumatize them. So telling someone, hey, speed up, uh, might not be helpful, might be re-traumatizing. 
depending on how that looks. So that 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 might be what this these three SE therapists or SE practitioners are trying to accomplish. Maybe they're trying to get you to anchor in safety and then feel into your stuck defensive state. I don't know. I'm just that's uh, the brightest possible way of looking at this, but they should be able to explain what the hell they're doing. If they're not, that is a problem. If you just tell someone, hey, let's speed up, you're just giving advice. Anybody can do that. Um, that's They can get that advice from anybody. Hey, just slow down, relax. Or you got to relax first so you can feel your pain. Like, okay, that's not super uh, helpful unless you can actually do the steps required to help that person do that. And you got to be able to explain it. So that's this is like advice. I, I think it's very shallow uh, advice. I don't think it has understanding of what's actually happening. I don't think it necessarily involves co-regulation. You can definitely co-regulate with somebody by by connecting with them and then explaining the significance of being able to anchor in safety and slow down to be able to actually feel your defensive state mindfully. Sure. But you could also really be misattuned and disconnecting with someone and tell them, well, you got to speed up or you got to slow down. Um, that's not co-regulation. That's advice giving. And that's not really connecting with someone. I don't, I would argue in general. And maybe you're like, well, no, it's different in my case because like, okay, fine. In general, that's what I'm arguing. And so that's fine, but you need to be able to explain how you need to be able to connect with your clients or the people you're working with. If you struggle with this, uh, dear listener, fellow stuck knot, if you really struggle with anchoring in your safety state, I have a course just for you. It's called building safety anchors, building safety anchors. I've gone over, in this, what I just kind of laid out, I've gone over the what. I've gone over what's happening, what's happening on a polyvagal state level. Um, I didn't explain how. I, I can't explain the how of it uh, because that's that's my course. <laughs> through building safety anchors, I will explain to you how to activate your safety state. I will lead you through six different paths of anchoring in your safety state and practicing those and building the strength of your vagal break so that as a as a result you will feel more relaxed you'll feel more calm you'll feel more confident you'll feel more connected with yourself and with other people potentially so building safety anchors is how to do all this stuff it's not easy it's not easy but i got you covered part of uh building safety anchors and my other two courses as well is when you purchase the course you become you, you get access to meeting with me twice a month so twice a month during uh, virtual meetups, I call them stuck not meetups. You can meet with me. And if you have a question about the course, you can ask it and I will answer every question that you have. If it's a personal thing, a therapy thing, I can't help you. But if it's, hey, this doesn't make sense or help me understand this better, or I tried this out. Um, do you have any other ideas as far as anchoring through this certain path? And I'll, I will answer all those questions for you. I don't want you to wonder. In my courses, I, I never want you to be confused. So I, I will meet up with you and other course members twice a month and I will answer any questions and also do a brief lesson as, as well. So it's called Building Safety Anchors. Head over to justinlmft.com slash build safety. justinlmft.com slash build safety. I will, of course, have a link in the description. That's it for this episode. I want to also remind you about the SSIEC domain. When you sign up for my email list, you'll get, you will get that uh, download and that'll really help you kind of name what you're going through and hopefully start to parse out what the, the different domains of your present moment experience. Thank you so much for listening though, fellow stuck not. I do hope this episode has been helpful, has been a helpful resource for you in your process of learning and applying the polyvagal theory to your trauma. Bye.